the next section that we're going to have is advanced techniques and physical diagnosis of Lyme Borrelia complex under the auspices of Dr. Joseph Jemsik, who is a board certified clinician in infectious diseases. He began his clinical practice in Charlotte, North Carolina, where he diagnosed the first case of AIDS in North Carolina in 1983, subsequently devoting his practice to HIV care until 2006, establishing one of the largest private practices in the country while lecturing and publishing widely. For almost a decade in his early career, he also functioned as the first hospital epidemiologist in a private institution and was designated infectious disease consultant for the Carolinas Medical Center Heart Transplant Program. Dr. Jemsik is the namesake for the destination practice, the Jemsik Specialty Clinic, which operates out of Washington, D.C., and is exclusively devoted to the care of patients with Lyme Borreliosis Complex. For more information on the career and interests of Dr. Jemsik, please consult his website at www.jemsikspecialty.com. Dr. Jemsik. Thank you for having me. This was uh, sort of my notion um, because I thought, you know, I, nobody's ever done this. You know, if you give an exam, you try to be uh, consistent in what we do. We've been found quite a few things over the years. We've invented a few uh, tests, if you will, that are not named, but they're. Uh, I'm sorry, but it all is uh, geared towards our patients who come in with a whole range, as everyone knows, multisystemic illness dominated by neuropsychiatric issues. Um, and I'm an infectious disease trained person. I was an internist first. Um, and one of the good things about doing infectious disease is that it's always did spread across all the disciplines. So I had to know a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but it was truly very little. Um, <laughs> Um, but you know, if, if you're really uh, interested and serious about uh, doing this, and I think there will be a, a specialty of limeologist, if you will, or whatever it ends up being called, borologist, or hopefully not limeologist, but something. There's going to be a lot of us in the future because they'll be necessary. And you're going to have to be very good at a lot of things. You have to be very good at uh, dealing with mood and social issues in, in your family, interpreting what's going on in their environment. You're going to have to be a very good neurologist. You're going to be better than most neurologists you know. You're going to have to learn the endocrine system uh, extremely well, and uh, also GI, cardiac, musculoskeletal. You're going to have to know about pain. You have to become experts in pain management and trying to avoid narcotics. And you're going to have to um, also get pretty good with the psychotropics and knowing your limits and always, always collaborating with experts when they're available. Uh, sort of learning along the way who's friendly and is going to be uh, an additive uh, force and who's going to be antagonistic. Because frankly, uh, when you're good at this, when you become good at this, I'm speaking to the audience, um, you'll know more than the, uh, many of the consultants that have been recommended. You have to learn about imaging. You have to be extremely good at sleep medicine. You have to know all about sleep medicine. So I didn't, um, I didn't sign up for all that. <laughs> But, uh, you know, hopefully, a uh, good thing I, I knew infectious diseases um, pretty well. And, um, and there's another good thing is only, they've only created two new antibiotics in the last six years, so I haven't had to worry about that too much. Uh, the old ones are pretty good. Um, so, so that's kind of a background. So we get into this. Uh, let me just tell you what we do at our clinic. Um, we are a fee-for-service clinic, as I'm sure many of you are, because if you sign up with an insurance company, you might as well put yourself in shackles and march off to jail because you have been hijacked and you're their prisoner in our world. So that presents a um, financial challenge to our patients, which we very much appreciate it. We're a destination practice. We very much appreciate the fact that people have to travel a long way. Um, our first visit with a patient is preceded by um, a decent period of time so they can fill out our history form. We also ask them to type or allegedly print a chronology of their illness so we can review that and bring all pertinent records. And then we review all that with them. Most patients will come, not all, but most will come with um, someone else. And one of the things that you need to um, uh, practice right away is to, when you look at that other person, um, don't assume anything about that person or else the interview can get off to a very bad start. So if the, it's a female patient and the gentleman comes in and uh, 
so and so, hi, Miss Mus Miss uh, uh, Williams. Uh, is this your father? No, that's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, right? Off to a good start. Okay. You go out the door and say, can we try this again? It's worse the other way. Mr. Williams, is this your mother? No, it's my wife. So I just say, I guess you guys are related, huh? And let them tell me. So, and, and if it's a really sick patient who's traveled a long way and been to a bunch of docs, um, it's important to have that other person there, although they may not you know, they may or may not contribute in a uh, worthwhile way. They may be disinterested, frustrated, uh, skeptical, or they may be so full of hope. I hate it when they say, you're my last hope. I hate that. <laughs> and, I, yeah, you know, all you can say is I'll do the best. But you need that other person to balance because I'm going to ask a lot of subjective questions for which there are no answers. And I'll need some, and it's so important to have things written down and have some records to have at least some chronology and I can work off of that. Um, all right, so just, um, just for a few more minutes, I'm going to speak, and I'm going to do an examination on Mandy. Uh, Mandy, you want to step forward here? Mandy Hughes is um, volunteered to join me. <laughs> give a round of applause. Yeah, and um, is she your wife? <laughs> <laughs> <That's> your wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good crowd. All right, listen, just for that. All right, I asked my six-year-old. I said, I'm going to talk to a lot of people. I was just trying to make conversation. So my six-year-old, as some of you know, just went through two years of cancer treatment and uh, a transplant, and it's just, you know, she's inspired us, and I talked to her, and she's, unfortunately, they, my family lives in Charlotte, and I live where I have to, to work. So we miss each other, and I called her today, and she just got over a little bout of pneumonia, and she's feeling great. I said, honey, just to make conversation, I said, I'm going to talk to a lot of people. What do I do not to be nervous? Um, she said, well, just think like you're talking to my brother James and me, and it doesn't matter. Nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> so I went here in the front row. I want you to turn off the iPods, get off, you know, uh, SpongeBob. No, SpongeBob will come on later. No SpongeBob. Um, Okay, so the interview starts. <clears throat> Generally, our uh, hall nurse will bring the patient back. It's very important to me that I get the drugs right and the dosing right. And, uh, you know, some of the list, and if a patient brings their own pre-printed list, that's okay. I mean, I'm okay with that. I'll review it anyway. But we need to know what you're taking right now. Later on, I'll go through what you've taken, and I'll look at the timelines on that. Okay, and looking at the patient, you make an assessment. Are they well-groomed? Are they comfortable? Are they nervous? Is there pressured speech? Uh, is there involuntary movement? Is there obvious facial asymmetry? Uh, is there um, a skin complexion just sort of such that they're mottled? Are they pale? Are, are they obviously clammy? Um, are they underweight? Are they overweight? Um, and what about the partner? Sometimes the partner's in worse shape than the patient. <laughs> Um, and so we get a, a sense of that. So many people want to, so badly, to do well with the interview. I tell them, look, we've got two hours. We're going to take our time. I'm going to take the interview. I'm going to do it like three different ways. We're not going down one linear path. We're going to do it this way, and then we're going to crisscross, and we're going to do it this way. Okay, we'll get it all, and then I'm going to examine you, and then we're going to sit down and talk about it all. So we allow two hours for a new patient. It generally takes me 45 minutes to dictate that patient uh, to do it right. But at the end of it, they have an organized, hopefully organized, um, document, which uh, hopefully is the best summary they've ever had in terms of what's wrong with them, either for the last year or for the last 15 years. And then we send it to the patient. We send our work to the patient. And of course, we get about 5% back with red marks <laughs> on every page, <laughs> in the margins, underlined, crossed out. Please fix all this, these 110 errors. Um, but I think the patient enjoys that, and they look at that and they say, oh, yeah, that was good. Now I sort of understand because you – and then when they come back on the B visit, they usually have a page worth of problems because most of the neural categories are involved and they have all these other things. And on the second visit, we've had a chance to look at lab. They've done the procedures they want. We've modified their diet possibly. We've added a few medications. 
And on the second visit, it's even a longer list of problems, but the text is not very long. But this is the, this is what we call our B visit. It's like the longest, it's the most definitive problem list that we have can make. Because it's based on the first visit, which is then refined based on uh, a better understanding or acquaintance with that patient, plus what they've done in the interim to clarify. Get, get us old records, do this. Let's look into this lab. Is that right or wrong? And then, then we have something on which to work. Um, and then we go from there. And generally by that visit or the following visit, if therapy is appropriate, uh, if the patient's stabilized, we'll go from there. So. Um, What's the interval between A and B? Generally six weeks. You know, I'm just going to you know, modify what they do because obviously something's not working. And, and we'll give that. And we always have a callback situation so that we don't have to wait six or eight weeks on the follow-up and say, I tried the first week, it didn't work. You know, we encourage them to call. I have three people for triage that do nothing but answer the phone all day long. Um, and we try to get as much done in between. We do not charge the patient for that callback or for, for the modification of their schedule or to ask a question. 